Earth Hour is the biggest environmental event in the world. Each March, the end of March, around the world, millions of people turn off their lights for an hour. It's a symbolic action to show that you understand the links between energy use and climate change, and that you understand your own responsibility to, for energy use and what part you can play. Taking this Earth Hour beyond the hour is a goal of WWF. And as you can see, we've got the I will, if you will, pledge that you saw in the video. And another big part this year of Earth Hour is the Earth Hour Cities Challenge. So we're really thrilled to have the three finalists, all from BC, go BC, go BC Climate Action, go Carbon Tax, um, here to talk to us about what they're doing for the Earth Hour City Challenge. And at the end, I'll tell you a little bit more about the contest and the ways that you can participate in the People's Choice Award. And thanks so much to Carbon Talks for sponsoring this event to us and to the cities for all the time and effort you've put into your applications and your contest entries. Beautiful, thank you, yeah, this is great. So thank you, thank you, Linda. Thank you everybody for, for coming. We are super excited to be a 2013 finalist in the Earth Hour City Challenge. It's pretty cool when you're a little city to be one of 17 cities around the world competing for this. So. Colwood. Um, we also, a um, couple of weeks ago, got named as the second Canadian solar city in Canada, go us. And we're also the home of the uh, Solar Colwood program, which I'll give you a little bit of a heads up in terms of, of what we do. So I'm aware that most of you probably know where Vancouver is, and you probably know where Surrey is. You might not know where Colwood is, except if you went and looked it up. And you might not have been there. So, so part of my job is to sort of say, OK, here we are, way out in the West Coast, not so very far from you guys here, um, bottom end of, of southern end of Vancouver Island. Uh, when you zoom in a little bit, we're part of the, the greater Victoria area, uh, very coastal community, um, but we're little, 18, about less than 18 square kilometers, population's about 16,000. We've got about 6,000 homes. We're small. But we're also fabulous. We have lots of things, iconic things that you've probably heard about. Royal Roads University, also known as Hatley Castle National Historic Site. Fort Rod Hill Fiskard Lighthouse. Um, we have lots of kind of arts and cultural events um, happening. Uh, the chap on the bicycle up there, Ryder Hejdal, some of you might have heard with him. Good Colwood boy. Um, and I'm also here to let you know that yes, pigs can fly in Colwood. <laughs> so come and visit us. We're well worth the trip. OK, so getting serious on the, the energy side. So like lots of other communities, we did our community energy plan. We looked at where our carbon emissions were coming from, uh, You know, about a third from buildings, about two thirds from transportation. Uh, we said we're going to adopt the provincial goals. We're going to do 33% reduction by 2020. And then we had that aha moment. And the aha moment is this. We are a growing community. We are a rapidly growing community. Our population went up by about 10% over the last five years or so, and it's continuing to grow. Every new building that we bring into our community increases our carbon footprint. So in order to get to that 33% community ride reduction, it actually looks like a 50% reduction per capita. So our big goal just got really, really big. But that's OK. We're, we're good at thinking big. So. In terms of how we're getting there is a number of different ways. City leadership, really important. One of the things that we did about five years ago is we purchased this little electric truck. The initial cost was about the same as a regular diesel pickup, but it saved us about $3,500 a year in fuel costs. It's a good economic decision, and as it says, zero emissions, priceless. We now have something called our Solar Colwood Program. Under that, uh, one of the things that we've done is to put solar panels on our fire hall. And you can see a couple of different kinds of panels up there. On the left-hand side, you're seeing solar hot water panels, so we have nice, clean firefighters. And on the right-hand side, you're seeing the solar photovoltaic panels, so we have lots of, of light at our fire station. We're also going heavily into the electric vehicle charging. Uh, we have um, six chargers now around the city of Colwood, up and running. Um, pardon me, we now have eight up and running. Um, we have two on private property, one at one of our developments, one at a uh, local bakery, and six on city property. These are the ones at City Hall. <coughs> Citizenship leadership, huge. 
we have the best citizens in Colwood. These guys have taken up all kinds of challenges. So the family, you see Keith's family that you see there on the, on the left, and he does have a big family. He's got five kids. He's got the two in-laws who live there. He's got the tenant and, and he and his wife. Big energy bills. So he went ahead and he got an energy assessment done on his home. He installed ductless split heat pumps. He put on solar hot water. And his energy bills are now half what they were before. Is he happy? You bet. Arno, standing up on top of his roof on the right-hand side, um, he and his wife installed solar hot water heating. It's a big system. There's only two of them, but they also use it for underfloor heating. So again, it's a very good um, way of, for them of, of saving electricity. When you look at the things that are happening around our little community, we've already got a couple of hundred people who have done energy assessments of their home. We've got about 35 people who have installed solar hot water systems, 79 who have put in ductless split heat pump systems, very efficient way, by the way, if anybody's on electric baseboard heat, you need to know about this system. It's great. Uh, water and energy saving kits, so all the sort of the simple things like change out your shower head, um, save yourself all kinds of money that way. And we're looking to do a thousand actions or more within our little community. Developer leadership. Again, in a growing community, hugely important. The images that you're seeing in front of you, um, one for the drilling for GeoExchange for a new development that's now in and up and running, and the one on the right, um, which is now completed, which is also runoff, GeoExchange. Again, good energy saving, money saving for the residents of that area. This is capital city center. It doesn't look like this right now. Right now, it looks like a very big hole in the ground, but this is what's rising up out of it. They are doing a number of extraordinary things as part of this development. Um, you can see in the image a number of green roofs. Um, there will be um, you know, a number of solar panels through. They're also taking advantage of the fact that there is a sewer main going around the, the property. And so they wanted to tap into that sewer heat and put in a district energy sharing system. Again, they're looking at, and then they're putting in a, wanting to put in a small wastewater treatment plant. They're looking at energy savings of around 60%, water savings of around 40%. Huge difference in terms of how we do new development in, in our communities. Solar Colwood is this massive partnership. Um, the image that you see here is taken from last, or actually 2011 UBCM, where we won a, an award for our partnership approach with BC Hydro and with Royal Roads University. But there are about 15 partners already involved in the Solar Colwood program, and that continues to grow. We could not do our program without the partners. Every one of those partners brings something really important into the, the program. And I should recognize Natural Resources Canada, who were kind enough to give us a grant of almost $4 million to work towards this program, which has made a big difference to us. This is an interesting one. I didn't know from month to month where my energy was going in my household. I now have this little device sitting in my home. It's actually an Amazon Kindle, sitting in my home, sitting at my desk, and second by second, it's telling me how my house is using energy. That's information we don't usually have. So, so here's an interesting thing. So here it was back in October 2011, and it's ticking away, and you know, my fridge is on, and my computer's on, and you know, it's October, so the heat isn't on in the house yet. And you know, I'm using you know, 340 watts, and uh, it cost me about three cents over the last hour. This is what it looks like when I have the, I've had the washer and dryer going for a chunk of the afternoon, and um, I've got the electric heat on in my office, and whoops, my three cents for the last hour just went up to 72 cents for the last hour. Gives you real-time feedback, really lets you know where are those energy hogs in your household. It gives you the information you need to reduce your energy use at home. How can we, we're trying to get these into to all of our households. This wonderful little kind of Heath Robinson affair is actually a mock-up, um, but it's a, an innovation by one of our solar installers. So he's recognized that one of the things, the barriers for people in terms of putting on solar hot water is the upfront cost. People don't kind of really get this kind of saving over a long period of time. So he's developed this system which is cheaper to install, um, and he's doing the final testing, and we're hoping to, to roll it out. But that's the kind of innovation that we really want to encourage. Here's another one. This is our local baker. Makes really good buns. Um, so Dave has always been a fan of electric cars, couldn't wait to go out and get one, got one, put on a public charging station on the outside of his bakery. And then he went, oh, here's an interesting opportunity. And he put solar panels on his roof. So those solar panels, solar photovoltaic panels, are sized so that they run his car for a year. So he runs his car on sunshine. 
Oh, and by the way, he also uses it to power his bakery and make really good buns as well. Okay, uh, one of our partners, uh, Royal Roads University, has been a huge partner for us. They're doing the monitoring of the program. The students are doing tons of research around the program. Um, so we've had various classroads, uh, classroom groups looking at various different aspects of the program. How can we do it better? This particular group was looking at the, the life cycle of the electric car. You know, is it actually, you know, you pay more for electric cars up front, but where's that kind of so-called payback period? The answer is about five to six years, possibly less. Um, on the right-hand side, some work being done out of Camosun College. Again, that kind of tie into our academic community um, and our technical and trades. So they're testing out various different kinds of solar panels, which work best in our climate. Local economy, international marketing. This is actually the solar hot water system going up on my roof. Um, but as part of this program, we trained 12 of our local First Nations folks to be solar installers, and then we put them to work as part of the, the installation program. Um, so Ed has now gone on and taken a full-time job with a solar installer company. And the nice thing about clean energy is a lot of it is local and local-focused and creates those local jobs. This is also one of my favorite pictures. This is Mr. Terakawa. He was president of Sanyo Canada at the time, and he came out to visit us. Again, you know, we don't get a lot of visitors coming to see us in Colwood. But, um, but anyway, he had to, to come here and have his picture taken. Many of you will know that this is Royal Roads University, that it's Hatley Castle, but it's also Professor Xavier's School for the Gifted because it's where X-Men was filmed. And he really needed to, to have that picture taken so that he could share it with his kids. So you see, now you've got another reason to come to Colwood. <laughs> Part of what we do out of this program is trying to, to share the learnings. And I won't go into this today, but this is one of the slides I've used a number of times. This stuff is not easy. It's sometimes hard being the first. There's a huge learning curve. And part of what we're trying to do is make sure that we're sharing that learning with as many people as, as possible. And yeah, sometimes you get the nosebleed from um, doing, being the first and, and trying something new and different. But this is the message that I wanted to leave you with. You don't have to be big to make a difference. Think global, act at home. I will if you will. <laughs> Thank you, Judith. We're going to save our questions for after our three speakers have spoken. So our next speaker is Anna Mathewson, who's a sustainability manager for the city of Surrey. That's on. Maybe, so Elodie, can you find my presentation? I don't know anywhere else. There. <laughs> I don't think he gave me my stick back. It's right there. I see it there. Is it this? No. Yep. Oh, there you go. There you go. Okay, great. Uh, well, thanks for having me here, everyone. Um, as Elodie said, I'm Anna Matthewson. I'm the sustainability <coughs> manager with the city of Surrey. And uh, it's exciting to hear what uh, Judith uh, talked about in Colwood. So I'm just going to be giving you a little bit of background on Surrey. I know you said everyone knows where Surrey is. I don't know if that's always true. <laughs> so uh, we'll start with a little map. And it uh, shows you how geographically large Surrey is. I think we're one of the largest, if not the largest, geographic municipality in Canada. And um, I live in Vancouver, and I really didn't have a sense of that until I, until I started working for the city four years ago, is how large the blocks are, how large the grid size is, and so on. So anyone here from Surrey? One, two, yay, three people, hooray. Um, and I'm just pointing out city centre because I am going to talk uh, about a couple of key projects that we're doing that I think are making a big difference on the climate front, and I wanted to point out city centre for later purposes. So that's where Surrey is. Surrey is the third fastest growing city in Canada. So you don't need to know the numbers, but just look at the growth. So even from 2001 till now, we're almost at half a million people. And I think within the next 15 to 20 years, we're projected to have a population larger than the size of Vancouver. And again, if you're out there driving around or hopefully taking transit, you see the building that's going on in Surrey. Lots of people moving there uh, over the last 10, to 10 years in particular. Uh, a key challenge, obviously, and Judith ref 
reference this in terms of Colwood for managing our emissions. The demographics, just a note about this, because I think it's interesting and, and kind of helpful as we think about um, our emissions and where we can make some traction, is with young people. 20% uh, of kids born in BC are born in Surrey. We have the largest school district in the province. And one-third, this came out of the 2011 census, one-third of our population is under 20. Like it just, I think that floored, people knew that, but just seeing the actual statistic, I think it floored people. Um, huge uh, population of young people and a very diverse <coughs> population, obviously. Uh, these are some Alex's here and Peter from HB Lanark Golder. So um, you'll see some of your slides here, Alex, as I go through. They're working on a community energy plan for us in Surrey. And this, again, is just to show you the projection and the jobs that we hope to have in Surrey over the next, you know, up to 2040 and the growth in population. Uh, obviously a major factor, as I said. So this, uh, I don't actually know where this came from. I pilfered it from some other staff slides, but it shows you city centre today. So that's the little red area that I highlighted for you. And this is what we project it to look like. So these aren't actual developments, obviously, but this is just showing you this is the change that's coming to Surrey. And this city centre area is the region's second downtown. Um, and th these are the kind of things that we're, we're going to be seeing over the next number of years. Judith referenced the climate framework in BC, so probably a lot of you know about that, the, legislated, uh, the legislation, the climate action charter, and so on. So I'm not going to talk about that today. We do have GHG emission reduction targets in our OCP. They're the provincial ones that we adopted on a per capita basis to just reflect that Surrey is a fast-growing community. But I wanted to mention the sustainability charter, because to me, when I, when I was thinking about leadership and Judith was talking about that, I think one of the reasons that, um, you know, perhaps, I don't know why we've been selected as a finalist, although we're thrilled, is the kind of commitment that we have at a political level from the city of the mayor and council in Surrey. And the sustainability charter was one aspect of that. That was a document that they endorsed back in 2008. And it really set out a clear vision of wanting to manage growth in a more sustainable way in our city. The Energy Shift Program, Peter uh, Russell had a role in creating that. And what that was trying to do, that was more recently, that was a couple of years ago, was really get, a, get across in a, in a graphic that Surrey was taking action on a number of fronts. So within our corporate sphere, we had a corporate emissions action plan, we were greening our fleet, we'd been doing a number of very large retrofit programs in our corporate facilities. We were also on a, we're very economic <coughs> development focused, so we were trying to encourage clean energy businesses to locate in the city, uh, working with SFU Surrey and having those academic partnerships. And on the community front, through transportation and planning and so on, we had uh, a number of initiatives underway, including a community energy plan that I mentioned that we're still working on. So we're not one of the ones that have one yet, but uh, we're working on that right now. So the energy shift was really trying to pull all that together to show people these are the kind of things we're working on. Um, I mentioned transportation. Um, these are just some of the pictures I threw together last night, but uh, EV stations, we have more of those coming. We have transportation, cycling and walking, walking plans and so on, safe and active schools programs. I'm not going to get into a lot of those details, but this was just to show you that we, in addition to kind of the, the provincial framework for carbon neutrality and climate action in Surrey, we had a, a few pieces in addition to the sustainability charter that are kind of moving us in that way. Um, so a couple of projects I wanted to highlight in the, in the few minutes remaining. One is around our city centre. Um, so the city centre is that area that I'd highlighted. For those that come on the SkyTrain, it's Surrey Central kind of area where SFU Surrey is located. Um, King George is the last node. And then you have Surrey City Centre and Gateway. Those are the three SkyTrain stations that you might know. And um, the mayor, uh, mayor Watson Council made a commitment a few years ago to really revitalize the city center area of Surrey. And that was recognizing, like that graphic I showed earlier, that we expect a lot more jobs in that area. It is the region's second downtown. A lot more people are moving there. You see development coming. It's already going up. People are moving there. And one of those commitments was around moving our city hall, which right now is in a lovely area with very poor transit access um, in kind of the southern part of Surrey and Panorama. So one of the commitments they made was to build a new city hall right in city center. So that's what we're doing. We're building a lead gold city, um, city hall. And there's a, 
graphic of it with the balloons, lovely balloons going up in the air. It'd be fun to create these images. But, uh, and uh, what you see on the left there is City Center Library. It's a beautiful library if you haven't visited it. Um, Bing Tom was the architect. And uh, that's already open. So the, and then the other component of this um, is this that public plaza. So wanting to have a centrally located place for people to gather in Surrey. Um, but what I wanted to highlight too in the city center, so it's kind of an area where we see a lot of densification. We have a lot of goals around greater walkability, green infrastructure and so on. There's the city hall. Um, there's also a district energy system. So um, one of the things we're doing is part of, that's SFU Surrey by the way, and that's during, just as an anecdote, our, our Earth Hour event that we had in 2010. That's actually the lights out. So you can see there's a lot of lights on and we're gonna have to work harder this year to get all of those lights <laughs> off. Um, um, but that's SFU Surrey and then uh, the tower, the one tower that's there right now. But we're building a district energy system that's uh, based on geo exchange. So that's a big commitment that our council made. And what we also did in building that, the, the first piece of the system is really just um, heating the, uh, not this actually, but the new city hall and the library and then another tower that's going to go up in that particular area. Uh, and it's based on a geo exchange field. And we're looking to expand district energy opportunities in Surrey and trying to focus on renewables as inputs to that system. So possibly biomass, but I think that's all still um, you know, under discussion. This is just a graphic for maybe the more technically inclined people, um, just showing you that field going in. And uh, these, this was just a graphic to show you, you know, I've been talking about that population growth and, and job growth that we're seeing in this area or that we expect to see. And then we're taking a nodal uh, development approach to, to basically start small with district energy and then um, expand, you know, when the densities come, which we know are coming in, for example, on the King George node, working with Surrey Memorial Hospital with some waste heat opportunities. So that's kind of one piece I wanted to talk about. And another I just wanted to highlight was what we're doing around waste. And I think that's maybe one thing, a uh, piece of that, that makes us unique. Um, like others, we um, have just started, and some people have been doing actually organics collection for some time, but Surrey started a program of organics collection last year. And one thing that we did as part of that was we required the fleet be um, compressed natural gas. So we were working with our contractor who is a BFI, and uh, there's a fleet of compressed natural gas CNG trucks that are going around. So that um, collection started last fall. It's going to reduce, actually, the GHG reduction is about 2,600 tons. So our corporate footprint of 16,000 tons, if you're interested, you know, 2,600 tons is actually fairly significant in terms of a reduction that we expect. But one thing we're doing as part of that, so we started organics, we're using the CNG trucks, is Surrey's building an organics biofuel facility in Surrey. Um, for those that are into garbage and waste issues, you might know the transfer station in Port Kells. Right next to it is a vacant lot. The city owns it, and that's where we're building a biofuel facility. We're going to work uh, with, we got funding from P3 Canada to build it, and it's not uh, underway yet, but it, we expect it to be built by 2015. And I think in terms of climate issues, what's interesting to note about it is that that's where the organics right now are being picked up and sent to Richmond because there's only one facility that can handle that right now in the region. Um, the organics facility, we expect to handle 80,000 metric tons, including our own organics and yard waste that we're picking up around Surrey. And then we, from that, we will be creating a renewable gas, um, which will, I mean, it's not like it'll come right out of the plant and go into the truck, which some people think, but the way it's described to me is it'll be used to produce a renewable, but like a biogas that will probably go into the Fortis grid and, and be a renewable fuel. So it's kind of an interesting carbon uh, neutral loop in that sense. I just mentioned this. I'm not going to talk a lot about rapid transit, but you've probably heard, um, you know, like others in the region, wanting more rapid transit. And what our council's vision is, is for light rail. Um, along some key corridors in Surrey. So along 104th and that diagonal one is Fraser Highway and then uh, LRT or, or rapid bus along King George Highway. So where do we go in the future? I pilfered that from you, Peter. Um, and I wanted to highlight this because I think, I don't know again why we were selected as a finalist. I, I think for me, one of the things that's most interesting about Surrey is, is that we are growing and how do you within that context of growth reduce your emissions or try to bend where your emissions trajectory is going uh, these are some points from alex that i think are really valuable is that you know these deep um, energy and emission cuts are really challenging 
when you're in these edge cities beyond the metropolitan core. So how do we do that? And I think there's a lot of opportunity for us in Surrey around that, but it's their big challenges. We have a lot of greenfield. We have a lot of available industrial land and agricultural land and so on. So to me, that's really uh, the key challenge. And I, um, with apologies to the uh, mayors of our respective cities, oh, I'm getting to that. Um, this is some analysis that's been done with our community energy plan. So it just shows you some of the scenarios we're looking at. And here's our population growth. So how do you tackle that, right? We want to, we want to get that green one. We'd love to get it lower. But um, even with everything kind of thrown into the mix, it's going to be really challenging. So that's some of what we're trying to tackle in Surrey. Uh, but it can be done. And I don't have this animated, but I, I like this slide from Alex because I think what it shows is that if you focus your growth in the right way, it can be done. You can get per cap, big per capita GHG reductions, and you can get really big total GHG reductions. And there's apologies to the three mayors, but <laughs> for those of you that uh, saw the province on the weekend, I actually am probably not supposed to use this because I don't think it went over very well, but uh, I really thought it was funny. And then I added in your mayor, and we'll duke it out for the uh, Earth Hour uh, Capital of Canada. Thanks, everyone. Okay. I hope Sean has his boxing gloves on. <laughs> So our next speaker is Sean Pender. He's um, the Sustainability Assistant Director for Vancouver. Thanks so much. I'm really, really pleased to be here. Not only do I love to share the vision that we have of becoming the greenest city in the world by 2020, it's really interesting as I go to conferences across Canada uh, and as you head out to Toronto or Montreal, uh, how much people don't want to hear about BC anymore because that's, this is where it really all is happening. You know? And when you go to those conferences, it's not just Vancouver they're talking about. They talk as much about Surrey as beginning to emerge on, on, the, on the scene, but like, Little communities like Dawson Creek and, and Colwood really are getting a lot of attention because the big cities, you know, we've got three, well, five big cities, but, you know, we've got hundreds and hundreds of smaller communities. So I think it's really interesting to be out here because, you know, 10 years ago, we had to look far and wide to learn. Now we learn right in our own backyard, which is a lot of fun for me professionally. So <clears throat> when I got invited to speak here by uh, Climb, uh, Carbon Talks, which we do a lot of work with. They've helped us a lot to uh, begin to untackle some very complicated dialogues. Um, but when we got invited here by WWF to present a vision for a, a zero carbon city, actually two images came to mind. The first image, this is a picture taken of Kitts Pool uh, about a month ago. And this is a vision we don't want to see anymore. Uh, it's, it's a vision of what we're trying to avoid. That's uh, in December we had that big storm during uh, uh, what's called a king tide. And that's, that's Kitts Pool under the ocean. The other vision that we really want to focus on is that of becoming the greenest city in the world by 2020. And uh, about a year and a half ago, council adopted a, 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 an action plan that's to guide us there. And it really focuses on three things, zero carbon, zero waste, and healthy ecosystems. Today, I'm going to really focus on just the, the first part of that, the zero carbon. There's a lot of activity going into all areas of our plan. But as we talk about our, our, our strategy towards zero carbon, it's really built on four foundations. One is green buildings. One is about green transportation. One's about green mobility, and one's about partnerships. So um, our vision here is to lead the world in green building design, construction, and operations. We're shooting to have uh, all new construction be carbon neutral by 2020. That's only seven years from now. Uh, and to reduce the energy use uh, and emissions from all the existing building stock by 20%. That is a ugly target. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a great target to strive for. <laughs> it just frightens me. <clears throat> so what are we doing about it? These aren't just plans. We didn't write these plans to sit on a shelf. The entire organization, the city of Vancouver, and most of our significant partners in the community have orientated themselves towards working together to achieve these shared goals. First, what are we doing about it is we're really working uh, a lot with both of the major utilities to enable existing buildings to reduce their energy use. We've got our home energy loan program. Uh, we're about to launch a, a large-scale condo retrofit program. And we do a lot of work with small businesses to help guide them through uh, how they can reduce their energy use and then facilitate that on their behalf. In addition to that, um, in Vancouver, you know, you go to many communities and they're very proud of building a gold, lead gold building. In Vancouver, 
All rezonings require lead gold certification. So lead gold is now the new standard of construction for large construction projects in the city of Vancouver. In addition, our building code, especially in single family homes, is the most energy efficient code in North America. And what does this look like as it comes to hit the ground? Well, some of it is like um, our New Van Dusen Visitor Center, where we capture rainwater and use it in the building. We've got solar heating. Um, and it, it's just symbolic of the changes. Over a very short period of time, there's been a massive transformation in the city. Uh, there's been a 46% increase in the number of lead developments in the city. And we were already the national leader uh, in 2008. Second part of our vision is to uh, move towards uh, zero carbon through green transportation. And really here, the goal is to, to um, as Gord Price likes to say, is the end of motordom. <laughs> um, and it really is to make walking, cycling, and public transportation the preferred transportation options. We, we no longer refer to them as alternative transportation because they aren't alternative. These are becoming the new norm and rapidly will be uh, far outstrip the, the use of automobiles. So what are we doing about that? Really, in terms of green transportation, Vancouver's long been known for its controversy and its success in terms of creating vibrant and complete neighborhoods, which is really, really essential. You can't do public transit. You can't do walkability. You can't do cycling unless you've got compact communities that have a mix of uses to live, work, and play. We're also partnering aggressively to expand and improve transit service. And as we all know here, the, 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 these are very, very expensive projects, and the cities can't do them alone. So this is a challenge. Very delighted to be proven right in terms of building the Canada line. The city had massive uh, arguments with TransLink about the capacity that that line needed to be built to serve. And, um, we forecast that it would be at capacity almost as soon as it was built, and TransLink did not agree with us. And how, on one hand, I'm glad we're right, and it's too bad we didn't build it bigger to start with. Um, but the other two areas, which maybe don't get as much media, but well, actually, they do get a fair bit of media, <laughs> but are really, really excited, are really, really exciting. And the city now has really embraced, I mean, we've been a very walkable city, Walk Score Canada, or Walk Score, uh, if you look up Walk Scores of cities across North America, we're the most walkable city in Canada, I think the third most walkable city in North America. Um, and we're really only now beginning to focus on improving the pedestrian realm. We've got our pedestrian safety plan. We know where the accidents occur. Uh, there's a, a real focus on pedestrian infrastructure to continue to facilitate and build upon that success. Um, and the other one for me personally is really exciting is, is the transformation you see. I've been a cyclist in the city for about 15 years. And over the last five years, it is like it's not something that that weird guy in spandex does anymore. <laughs> it really is becoming a very normal thing, not just for students, but for professionals, not just for middle age, upper middle class males, but for all demographics. And it's really, really become mainstream. And I think we saw it a few years ago in the battles around the separated bike lanes, which um, have, have proven to be a success. And not only are they a success now, I think, again, as we see this transformation, you'll see those become more and more powerful ways. And our aspiration is that drivers start to see that bike lanes actually reduce congestion. It's, yeah, we have to take away a lane, but a lot more bikes can use a bike lane than cars can use a lane of traffic. And moving to the improved bike routes and, knock on wood, a bike share program coming next summer. So what does that look like? I mean, there's lots of images of what that looks like. I'm personally really excited about this because I've been working on this for quite a while. But the number of car share vehicles in the city has doubled since 2010. We're probably one of the biggest cities in the world for car sharing. You go, there's still cars. That's true. But uh, car shares reduce the average amount of greenhouse gas emissions associated by its members by about 50% for transportation. So they're a very, very powerful tool. And it's not public money that's required to do it. There are very small steps that uh, local governments can take to really, really empower these things to happen. I'm hoping there's more slides. <clears throat> Um, another, another image of what this looks like is uh, we now have uh, over 245 kilometers of cycling routes in the city. And since 2008, in three years, uh, between 2008 and 2011, uh, cycling increased over 35% in the city. So it's a very, very rapidly uh, growing mode of transportation. 
Third element of our vision to becoming a uh, zero carbon community is to eliminate our dependence on fossil fuels. We share that target of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 33% from 2007 levels. It's, it is a stack deck. I think, you know, looking at communities like Surrey, Vancouver is a growing city. I mean, our economy is growing, our population is growing. But uh, when we do inside the house comparisons, uh, you know, you can go per capita, you can go gross reductions, but, uh, you know, comparing. Uh, economic development or population growth and the change per greenhouse gas emissions per population is really a powerful indicator. It's hard to communicate to a public audience, but when we look around the world, actually, uh, Austin, Texas is one of the greatest leaders. It's a fabulously, you know, growing, growing very fast and still uh, having great success in reducing their emissions. So what are we doing about it? Well, the Olympics actually really uh, changed how the city saw itself. We realized if we're going to continue to grow, if we're going to continue to have a dynamic, uh, a dyna dynamic economy, growth, you needed to get de decouple prosperity from fossil fuels. And so it really forced us to go, how can we make renewable energy work? We've got some of the lowest energy prices in the world here. It makes the economics very, very challenging. And what we're trying to do is to do new tools, new ways of infrastructure, new ways of thinking about the city that can make the business case work out. One of the first examples was we're now looking at heating entire neighborhoods with renewable energy. Uh, both communities have talked about district energy. We built the neighborhood energy utility to serve Southeast Falls Creek, which when that community is built out, that's over 15,000 residents. But the system's already expanding. We've hooked up Science World, the new uh, campus along Great Northern Way will be provided by that heat. And that's, that's a system that takes renewable energy. And the thing with district energy is they can take heat energy just about from anywhere. And so you're not actually pegged to a specific technology. You can uh, adapt the technology to the situation and the opportunities. You can recover waste heat. The, the one in Southeast Falls Creek takes heat out of the sewer systems and solar hot water. So you can combine renewable systems under that same piece of infrastructure. But the thing is, is it's not just one great example. We've got eight major new developments of that scale currently being planned or built uh, to do district energy in the city right now. So second part of our vision around renewable energy is to convert carbon pollution into renewable energy. And at the Vancouver Landfill, most folks don't know, but Vancouver operates the landfill out in Delta. And um, we capture, um, well, about 70% of the methane that's emitted uh, and convert it into a renewable heat and power source. Uh, and uh, currently our food scraps uh, will be, well, Soon, our food scraps will be converted into biogas. <laughs> and in, in Surrey, that's correct, yeah? <laughs> well, that's the good thing about being the greenest city in the world, and I know the mayor made the point when he was developing the plan. It's like, we want to be the greenest city in the world, and we want to help everyone beat us. So, uh, again, we're happy to share our learnings and lessons, because really we just want to raise the bar for everybody. But finally, not only are we doing district energy and, and uh, bioenergy, but also it's that transformation of our, uh, of our transportation systems. And really, we worked very hard with BC Hydro to engage the province and the feds to get the incentives for the homeowners, for charging stations across the province. And in Vancouver, of course, we're building them. We've got it required in our building code, 20% of all parking stalls in new development have to be EV charging ready, which was just shook the North American building market. Well, how can you say that? What can, how can you do that? Um, but really, uh, you, talk, you hear a lot about the public charging, but most of the charging, 90% of the charging is going to occur at people's homes. And so we, uh, we, we started to focus on that. And what does that look like? Well, our NEU you, produces 70% less carbon pollution <coughs> than a typical neighborhood. The landfill gas project, it, it uh, eliminates 200,000 tons of greenhouse gases a year, which is about like taking 40,000 cars off of the road. We're uh, rapidly deploying our electric vehicle infrastructure. And the final part of our plan is to empower action and leadership through partnerships. So we partner with Carbon Talks. One of my favorite partnerships is uh, through City Studio, where students in all of the six uh, academic institute, high uh, post-secondary academic institutions can earn credits to co-create the greenest city with us. They're actually, we've got about 1,000 students currently engaged in solving problems and resolving issues and building projects on the ground. Uh, we partnered with the Vancouver Foundation to launch our $200 million Greenest City Fund, where community groups and youth can apply to, to take a leadership and establish things like the Tool Library. 
And finally, we partner with non, uh, community groups and nonprofits like Soul Foods to, to rapidly increase our urban agriculture, like uh, this large-scale urban farm that's going in, that has gone in right down by Canada Place. So Vancouver's vision for a zero-carbon city. We want to have the greenest buildings in the world. We want to have green transportation. We're rapidly transforming to renewable energy. And really, really at the heart of it is empowerment and partnerships. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Don't be shy. They won't bite. <laughs> I think we already have one here. Uh, I have one. I'll ask you to speak in the mic because we're webcasting this. Uh, thank you. My question is for the uh, fellow from Vancouver. Um, my sister uh, wants to buy a uh, plug-in car, but uh, she uh, lives in an apartment and there's no infrastructure. And you mentioned that uh, you would be requiring uh, plug-in infrastructure for new buildings. Is there any consideration of retrofitting older buildings? We, we are very much. And I'll leave you my card because we are actually, we've got funding in place and we're trying to test the models of how to overcome some of the barriers within those existing buildings. And we're actually looking for buildings to partner with. And, if, and specifically, buildings where people have or want to have electric vehicles. Thank you. And I, we have one question from Twitter from Chris Malmo, who would like to hear more about collaboration with other municipalities in the Greater Vancouver Regional District for low carbon transportation. From? Well, I guess it's to the both of you. <laughs> you want to tackle that? <laughs> <laughs> That's a, it, it's a good question. I'm not in the transportation planning group. No. Um, I think you hear a lot of uh, publicity about the, the struggles between Surrey and Vancouver. Um, but we don't think it's an either or. You yeah. have to, we have to do both. We understand. I mean, in Vancouver, we've got the Broadway Corridor. If anyone ever tries to go down the Broadway Corridor on transit, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a route that's at capacity. But we also understand for transformations like the, the images that Surrey has of, of their core, um, they, they need rapid transit to support those or, or the automobile use will continue to increase. Yeah, I, would, I mean, I would agree. I don't, I'm not in transportation planning either, but I, I think uh, our mayors have been generally supportive of each other's efforts and with other mayors as well in the region. Um, it's just as we, everyone in the room knows, it's, it's a funding issue, right? And how do you, how do you get there? Anybody else? Thanks. Um, I, <clears throat> my name is Carly and I'm from the Cool North Shore Cool Neighborhoods Program um, and I think my question is particularly relevant to Coalwood. Um, what kind of things have you done to particularly engage citizens and encourage them to take actions in their own lives and in their own homes and what has been successful? Okay. So there's a huge focus in our programs around what individual homeowners can do. So one of, the, one of the things that we're really trying to do is encourage people to start with a home energy assessment because it's just really good basic information. Where is it that, that you know, your home's building envelope is where a lot of your heat is lost. So you know, one of the families that I showed up there, Keith and his family, they took their, their home from an Enaguide 73 up to an Enaguide 86. That's a big difference in terms of how much energy you just simply need to, to heat your home. So we've got, we've got a huge focus on what it is that individual residents can do, and that's very much where we've directed our, our incentives program around that. How we're getting the, the message out, I mean, the, the joys of being a small community is, is there's kind of lots of neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor talk going on. Um, we have a, a team of people who are working and we do all kinds of things like we have information nights, invite people in. We've had, you know, a, a Sunfest event every year where we kind of bring in all the local solar installers and the ductless split heat pump installers and the electric vehicles. And we say, come on, you know, I don't care where you live in Greater Victoria, come on out to our community. Come and sort of touch and feel this, this stuff and, you know, talk to the installers, talk to the people who know about it. Um, learn more about the possible and it's a very kind of it's a very safe place to be because if you invite an installer to your home it kind of feels like you're sort of making that commitment whereas if you kind of go to this public event where you can just kind of find out without actually admitting where you live um, <laughs> it, it's got that kind of safety feeling um, and people love like any events where we've got the electric cars people love them they're pouring all over them and you know oh, yeah. Ooh, what does it do and how far does it go and how fast does it go and all the rest of it 
I can vouch for that. I spent eight hours talking about the Nissan Leaf with people on our Canada Day event. Like, we had all these other things going on. All they wanted to talk about was that car. It was like owner's manual flipping through. Part of my journey here was by a Nissan Leaf. <laughs> I'll say that. Thanks for your, your leadership and inspiration, all of you. Um, Sean, you said something that I think is quite instructive, and that was, you know, BC communities are further ahead than anywhere else in the country, and almost in North America. I think one of the key elements is we have targets um, that are mandatory for every municipality and policies and actions to achieve, and the other element is actually really modest funding, and it's BC Hydro funding um, to support community energy planning, individual initiatives, and that doesn't exist anywhere else in the country. But it's only getting us so far, and I think it's one of the biggest obstacles that Colwood's able to do outstanding things because there's several million dollars, dollars now. That's right. Most municipalities don't have line items for doing carbon energy management work. We need more dough. Um, we need dough for um, big initiatives like rapid transit in Surrey and Vancouver, and for smaller initiatives like retrofits and the policy and planning work. There's a business case for but you just not the, the money around. And I think one of the greatest opportunities in BC within the next year and a half is reforming the carbon tax. And it's about being able to recycle a significant and growing portion of that carbon tax into community uh, carbon and energy management opportunities. And um, I think regardless of whatever government is established in BC, that's one of the, the areas that we can really begin to look at in helping us bend that emission trajectory. And I just want perspectives from any of you about what are your plans and what are your insights around how we can really effectively do it? Because I think it's just a, a momentous opportunity. I, I'll, I'll take a first crack at that and let the other two, two follow on. Um, I'm not a provincial politician, so I'm not going to speak for that one. Um, but part of, the, part of the thinking and the purpose behind Solar Colwood is, is yes, we had this fabulous injection of funds without which this would, would not have been possible. And we've also had other contributions from, from BC Hydro and others that, that really make a big difference. But part of what we're trying to do is to prove out the business case. A lot of people get hung up on this kind of the initial cost of doing the energy, you know, whether it's kind of insulation in your attic or whether it's, you know, buying an electric car or whether it's putting on this solar hot water heater. We're trying to show how that's actually a good business decision, whether you're an individual homeowner or whether you're a business. And in order to get to that, we needed enough people doing it that we can start to collect the data. So one of the things that we have is a partnership with BC Hydro, and they provided funding that actually in the form of incentive towards these ductless split heat pumps. And what that's now done is, is we're aiming for sort of somewhere between 100 and 200 homes with those ductless split heat pumps installed, and then Hydro kind of tracking their energy usage, so they really have good local information on what that does. So they can then take it out to the rest of the province and say, look, we have statistical information on what this does towards your home energy bill and why this is a good business decision. I think that's why the, the student project looking at electric cars was also interesting. Again, you know, people get hung up on the, you know, you pay more for an electric car up front, and I would argue that that will come down over time. Um, but again, you know, when you look at the, the life cycle, and that's how we need to start doing our thinking differently. It's, it's, you know, yes, what you pay up front, but it's also what you save down the road. That's the information we need to roll out there that starts to make that business case. Having said that, I totally agree with you on the carbon tax. We really need to, our electricity is too cheap, our water is too cheap. Um, we really need to kind of properly price these things to help people to make good decisions. I, I think it is a, it's a political question, it's a political challenge, so my insight is as good as anyone else's in the rooms, I would think. But I, I mean, I think when we have a provincial election coming up, I mean, it, it really is for people to mobilize and, and speak to their MLA or uh, their candidate in their riding to say that this is important to them, that the carbon tax is important. I think the, when they introduced the carbon tax, I think they, they did it wisely to make it revenue neutral initially. Um, I think they did it very wisely to show how it would increase over time so that people could plan for the changes that were coming. And I think that's what you would need to advocate for is, uh, is a shift to capture some of those revenues to do the things that so many communities are clamoring for, like public transportation and incentives for renewables. Um, 
but also to continue to increase it and to set that trajectory, whatever it is, and lay out the roadmap. Okay, over the next five years, this is what you can expect. Because really what we've come to is natural gas prices are mm -hmm. uh, like at this crazy low, and we've done the analysis, and we were hoping it was a blip. We were hoping something would change, and we just don't see it. It's not, the, even with all the conversion from coal to natural gas in the States, and even if we start exporting it, really low natural gas prices are here to stay. So why not increase the carbon tax? How much is that going to cripple our economy? Because it really is so cheap here compared to just about anywhere else in the world. I just want to comment uh, on the resources, and it's not so much on the carbon tax, but uh, just to pick up on Judith's point, like in Surrey, our sustainability office is me and one other person. Like we have two, a staff of two, and obviously there's staff in the organization and engineering and so on who have a role. But when I look at trying to get to people to make that business case. I need people to do it. I need a community energy manager. Or I, need, I need some resources, right, some staff to actually go out to homeowners and to reach businesses and to make those, that business case to people. And hydro funding has been help, very helpful in that regard, but it'll, like you say, it only goes so far. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm just supporting what others are saying. Like, I agree, the business case is strong. It's just you need to to reach people to make the case. And in Surrey, our difficulty is a lack of staff resources to do it. You know, at least right now, that's my immediate, <laughs> one of my immediate challenges. So we'll take uh, two more questions. I have one here and one over there. And uh, you can still send us your questions via email, and I'm sure our cities will be happy to publish a little something for you. Uh, my name is Edna, and I work with an organization called Sustainable Cities International. So I have two questions. One would be, like, uh, we work with a lot of cities in other countries, and I was wondering, if you were to give an advice to another city, like, what would you say are the first steps that they need to get to, to get to the point where you guys are at right now? And the second one is, are you, as a city, engaged in any effort or any, any, any support to international learning of your experiences? Um, I don't... I, I mean, I'm not uh, connected with a lot of global cities. I mean, I'm connected with a lot of cities across North America, but um, my immediate you know, experience in sustainability hasn't extended to sharing, because there's a cities around the world that are doing you know, more than we're doing. We have a lot to learn from cities in Europe and so on, but I haven't had myself any direct contact. I know we have, uh, through MEG, uh, project around sustainability indicators where there's an opportunity to work with cities in... All over the world, but we're not we're not there yet. So. I don't know if you guys have had and in terms of advice for yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for me, the advice because we fortunately get invited to to speak and share some of our insights mm -hmm. around the world just just because of the profile mm -hmm. a bigger city gets around this, and you know, often it it, it we we really emphasize keep it pedestrian. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I find many, many cities, they want to go for the, the, something really, really flashy. And when you get started, and it, it's really interesting because I've been to Mexico a, a number of times to see that this idea of you know, cycling and walking as, as actually this is the solution. It's not just um, some crazy idea. And, and that it's actually taking hold in cities like Monterey and Mexico City. And, um, so I think that's, for me, it really is because it's, you do need a vision that galvanizes people, but you can spend so much resources on things that will never scale up and never have a business case. So you do need to excite people's imaginations, but you really do have to work initially on those solutions that are quite pedestrian. And it, it's, it's insulation. You, yeah. know, you start with insulation before you go to photovoltaic panels. You start with walking before you go to you know, a SkyTrain system. So. So in terms of the, the international piece, we we're very lucky because we've got Royal Roads University right in our mix. So when we're, we're working with classes of students, these are folks who have come from all across Canada, but also sometimes from a, around the world. So that's a kind of a very nice connection in for us. Um, and also we were um, fortunate, one of our partners recently was at the World Futures Energy Summit in Abu Dhabi talking about our program. So a little bit of reaches out into the, into the big wide world. Um, but always opportunity to, to do more. Um, in terms of the advice, one of the things that I think has served us very well is we've said it's always about the win-win-win. So it's about um, happy homeowners. How can we reduce their energy bills? Because that's a good thing. How can we use this to support our local economy? And how can we use this to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? 
Thank you. So I think we have one last question. Uh, if you can keep it short, then I'll let Linda wrap it up to give you some tips on how to support this initiative. Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful that we're building lead, uh, uh, making lead requirements for new construction. Uh, there's a problem, however. Uh, these buildings are complicated, and there is a near total lack of people who know how to operate them properly. And so very often, the new buildings are even less efficient than older construction, simply because they aren't operated properly. Um, in the work that I've done, I, uh, we've looked at uh, what kind of training programs there are that are truly effective in BC, and there are none. So the question is, what are you doing? Uh, how are you helping to establish training programs for uh, people to operate uh, generally uh, multifamily or mixed-use uh, buildings that, uh, so that they operate to their design? Um, it's a very good question. It's a great challenge. I mean, we've worked more with the utilities than the, the technical colleges so far to build those programs because we, uh, BC Hydro, again, is a, a fabulous partner to have. And so their continuous optimization program, which creates that incentive and, and, and begins to develop that capacity, not through direct training, but through creating those opportunities. Um, I'm, Douglas College, I believe, offers a fairly good um, mm -hmm. program mm -hmm. for energy manager training uh, in terms of operating it. But we are running into that, that problem with complex buildings. And, and our green buildings team, they are, you know, this year they're working on two elements of, of capacity development. I mean, one is just in the holistic design and that integrated design approach. And, and um, that's the, the big focus this year. And I'll have to go back and, and ask that second question about the operators. Because I know our own operators, as the city gets more and more advanced buildings in its portfolio, uh, have that same question. Thank you. I'll pass it the mic to Linda, and she'll explain how you can vote for your favorite city for the People's <laughs> Choice Award. <laughs> And remember that Colwood is the smallest city, so we need the most amount of outside help. <laughs> <laughs> Their population is way larger than ours. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks to everybody. Um, I just want a little full disclosure here. I was a member of Vancouver's Greenest City Action Team and really happy to work on it. I am not a jury member, so there's no conflict of interest. <laughs> just thought I'd get that out of the way. And I realized that uh, that uh, not everybody uh, figured out the rules about this Earth Hour City Challenge. I should have said a bit more at the beginning. Um, what we're doing is asking cities to submit their credible and plans and actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and achieve climate goals in five areas, buildings, energy, transport, food, and waste. So that is how the cities are being judged. And so I just have to say a bit more about the um, program and how you can get involved and vote for your favorite city. Why are we doing this? The beyond the hour, it's because most people in the world live in cities today and 70% 70, 70 of carbon emissions come from cities. So cities are a key part of the solution to climate change and that's what we're trying to do with the Earth Hour City Challenge. Uh, this is WWF's goal. It's a global goal. It's basically just to keep those uh, temperatures down and reduce the carbon footprint of cities, something that I think all the cities have shown that they share. Here is the international jury, the expert and independent jury that will be judging, uh, that has already judged the three finalists. So they've looked at the plans they submitted online to an online database called Carbon, two ends. Um, so you can see it's a pretty stellar jury. It has uh, Gino Van Bergen, the Secretary General of ICLE, the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives, started in Toronto, by the way. Martha Delgado used to be the Environment uh, Minister for Mexico City, now in a new role. And uh, pretty amazing to have Christiana Figueres, the head of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So this is the jury, and they are aided by the global firm Accenture, the consulting firm. So they went through a really rigorous process, grading all the cities and choosing the finalists. What's next? 
There are six pilot countries this year. Canada's one of them. You can see the countries and the finalists listed there. Only two from Italy due to technical difficulties. <laughs> um, but these are the... <laughs> I'll say no more. <laughs> these are the finalists that you can vote for. And you don't have to vote for one of these if you don't want to. You can vote for Siena if you love Siena. Um, as I said, there'll be uh, one of these cities will be the Canadian Earth Hour Challenge champion. The international jury will make that selection. Then out of those six national winners, there will be one global Earth Hour champion selected by the jury. But in order to get people excited about this, there's also the People's Choice uh, contest. It will run for one month between February 15th and March 15th. And all 17 of the finalist cities are eligible for the People's Choice Award. So you can vote for Colwood. You can start your, you can vote for Surrey. You can vote for Vancouver. I can't be partisan. <laughs> you can pick your city and vote for them. And then uh, the awards will be given at an international ceremony. At last year's um, champion, they had a one national country ran this program last year, Sweden, and Malmo won. So this year, uh, the ceremony will be in Malmo, and uh, the torch will be passed to the new uh, city winner. So the people's choice. You can vote three times. Vote once, vote twice, vote three times. You can vote by going to the website starting February 15th, clicking to vote on the city of your choice. There will be a uh, discrete website with profiles of all the 17 cities, uh, profiling their actions with photos that they've submitted, films they will be submitting, hopefully, <laughs> and um, other things. Uh, you can also, this is a cool one, you can uh, load a photo, upload an Instagram photo, go out to your city, go out to your favorite part of the city, take a photo of how it exemplifies uh, the switch to a low-carbon future, renewable energy future, upload it, and that will count as a vote for that city. You have to, of course, identify that it is part of your um, vote for a particular city. Or you can submit a suggestion online for how your city can do even better. Um, so you can, you can vote three times. You can mix your votes up if you want or put them all in one, uh, one city. So that's it. I encourage you all to look at our website, look at the Earth Hour City Challenge, and con I really congratulate all three of these cities. And just before I end, I also wanted to recognize that I was really helped with my efforts on um, this uh, contest uh, by Aaron O, who's here today. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, we had fun last summer contacting cities, uh, mainly in BC, so uh, we did have some counterparts in WWF in Toronto and other places but we put on a real push in BC, and I can say it paid off. <laughs> so thanks very much, and thanks to Carbon's Talks again. So again, a big thank you to our three speakers, and thank you to all of you for making it today and supporting our city's efforts to become a little less carbonated. <laughs> so um, we do actually have a profile of each of these cities posted up on the Carbon Talks website. So if you want to visit us, we're at www.carbontalks.ca. And uh, yeah, send us some comments. Um, we're always happy to publish them online. Have a great day. <laughs>